the Spirit of truth. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have told you. Still have, <coughs> I still have much to tell you, but you cannot yet bear to hear it. However, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears, and he will declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me by taking from what is mine and disclosing it to you. Everything that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will take from what is mine and disclose it to you. So be it. morning if you'll bow with me we'll start with prayer father in heaven we do thank you for being able to come and freely worship you we thank you that your presence is here with us in the form of the holy spirit we thank you for the work that jesus christ did when he came in the flesh and taught us how to live and and then died for us that he paid the price and that you were satisfied with that lord we thank you that when he went away to prepare a place for us he said that he would ask you to send the promised gift of the spirit and it would be better for us Lord, help us to read your word today and to understand that it's not just a power that you've sent, but you yourself dwell with us. We thank you and praise you for all the wonderful things that you're doing, for this beautiful plan of redemption that's so mysterious and so incredible and that we can be a part of. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to pick on Debbie a second, but not to, don't look at my eyes, boom, not to say anything she did wrong. But when she said something about the Spirit, she said, it. Now, let me just ask you a question. If I was referring to my wife and I said, well, we were doing this and it said to me, right? And we do it all the time. But the Holy Spirit is referred to in Scripture as a person. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the third person. That it is the person of God dwelling in and among us. And so many times we don't think that way. Can you see this picture? It's my wife, Sherry, not it, and she's with our grandchildren. And I have this picture. And it's important for for us to know who Sherry is to her grandchildren. Okay? Because there's times when Sherry is not with her grandchildren. Does it change who she is to her grandchildren? Not one bit. It helps to put a picture to it and everything else, but they know who she is. She's their nana. She's the one that does their boo-boo. She's the one that provides for them. She's the one that sets them straight and everything, too. Who is the Holy Spirit to you? I start off with that so that we can dig into this a little bit deeper and understand, and, and I'm guilty of it because we can't put a face to the Holy Spirit. We can't put a face to God. We can put a face to Jesus, and that face that we see, who knows how accurate it is or isn't. If you don't know it, it was a king's son that, that he wanted Jesus' picture to be remembered that way. I don't remember more than that. I can't tell you more than that. I didn't plan on even saying that. But when you realize that the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, He came to reside with you, It doesn't hurt at all to picture Jesus, the picture that you have for Jesus. Jesus walked and talked with his disciples, and he said, I'm not going to orphan you. I will ask the Father to send another. The first word that we're going to discuss is the words that uh, Merle read and the uh, Greek word used there, paraclete. You've heard me say it before. It's an intercessor. It is one a person, a being, that is called alongside for one's aid. Yours might say uh, advocate, yours might say comforter, 
It's a person that could bring you help, legal counsel, comfort you, and be your advocate. It's a person that you would go to, kind of like the kids go to Nana when they need to know what's right or wrong, because Nana always has the right answer. You might not like it, but she has the right answer. And you heard these things, you know, when people go away, you know, don't, I, I will be with you. They're still with you. They're in your thoughts and prayers, and, and you can picture them again. So whenever you're thinking of the Holy Spirit, if it helps, just picture Jesus. Because Jesus, the triune God, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father are one. Scripture tells that all throughout. So God is dwelling with you. Jesus is dwelling with you in the form of the Holy Spirit. Living with you, the temple veil was torn. The Holy Spirit has come to reside with you, and you are priests to carry out your mission. And Scripture says that the Holy Spirit will reveal all truth to you, will teach you all things and remind you the things that Jesus has spoken and done. A second word I want to go over is pneuma. Did I pronounce that right? Pretty close? Eh, he's glad. <laughs> I'm not the best on pr pronunciation for him. It is literally the third person of the Godhead. It can be anything from a gentle breeze to a mighty hurricane or tornado force. And that's kind of how the Spirit works through us. Sometimes we have to be quiet and listen to that still, small whisper, don't we, to hear God's voice. And in other times, we, it just, we just are flooded with that presence, and we feel like God is calling us to do this. It's something that cannot be stopped, but it's also something that you need to be perceptive of, that He is with you, that He is guiding you, giving you counsel, giving you advice, helping you, comforting you. It's also a character, the character of God, holiness. It is breath. It is life. It is what it contributes our soul and spirit. It's affection and much more. It is God, the triune God. The word never implies anything non-personal, not just a force, just not just a, a spirit as we think of ghosts and spirit, but as a person who resides in you, but you have to look at the spiritual instead of just the physical. Now I want you to think for just a second of the opposite of those two words. What if Jesus did, did not promise to send the Holy Spirit, to ask God to send the Holy Spirit, and you didn't have an advocate, a helper, a counselor, a comforter? What if you didn't have holiness inside of you, the breath of life? What would you have? You would have the opposite of all those things. Without the Holy Spirit, you would have no comfort, no help, no life, no forgiveness of sin. That's why Jesus said you must be born from above, born of the Spirit. And then the Spirit came at Pentecost and filled them mightily, and they began to speak in tongues to do their message of taking the message of reconciliation to the world. It just happened to be, just happened to be, that men from all tribes and tongues and nations were there, and the Spirit moved mightily among them, and they could understand the message of Jesus Christ in their own language, in their own tongue. The Holy Spirit is mentioned about 75, in the Old, 75 times in the Old Testament, about 275 times in the New Testament, always with an implication of personal. Does Sherry have a personal relationship with her grandchildren? Even if she goes away for a long time and promises to come back for them, will she not have a personal relationship with them? Will she not still be with them in spirit? That's why I put the picture to it, so you can try to get that image and get into more of a personal relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, He who lives inside of you. I want to go over some of the Old Testament verses that talk about the Spirit real briefly. In Genesis 1-2, Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And it seems mysterious, and we don't understand it. 
In Genesis 2, 7, the breath of life was given. Then the Lord God formed man from dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. We still don't have any personal emphasis there. But John 6, 63 in the New Testament, we read, The Spirit gives life. Huh, he is the one who gives life. The flesh, which we continue to look at, profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. And Debbie mentioned again, kudos to her, we worship in spirit and in truth. Does that help? Because <laughs> I'm never condemning. I appreciate everything she does. In Numbers 27, we can read that in verse 18, the Lord replied to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man with spirit in him. In Judges 6, 34, So the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. We know the mighty things that these men were able to do. We even have verses about Samson, who might not have done all the things that he was supposed to do, but we know that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. In Judges 14, 19, Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, and gave their clothes to those who had solved the riddle, and burning with anger, Samson returned to his father's house. Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines in Judges 16.30. Judge 16, then he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people in it. So in his death he killed more than he had killed in his life. Judges 16 doesn't mention the Spirit, but you know that the Spirit of God was still with him and present, or he wouldn't have had the power that he had to do what he did in his death, in his final act. We need to be more like David, though, don't we? 2 Samuel 23, 1 and 2. These are the last words of David, the oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of man raised on high, the one anointed by the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. And we know David was not a great guy, but we know also that he was a man after God's own heart. It's about your relationship with God. And you know what David did not have? He didn't walk with Jesus and then Jesus say that it was better for him if he left because he was going to send the Holy Spirit to be with him. He might have foreseen that. I don't know any of those things. But we know that Jesus Christ came bodily in the flesh, lived among us, taught us how to live, expounded upon scriptures, stayed behind after resurrection, teaching even more. He laid down his life, went silent before his accusers, even though he had done nothing wrong. And then he rose from the dead. And we have a hope that the Old Testament saints could only dream of, wish of, wish for. Here's something that David wrote, Psalms 143. O Lord, hear my prayer. In your faithfulness give ear to my plea. In your righteousness answer me. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one alive is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued my soul, crushing my life to the ground, making me dwell in darkness like those long since dead. My spirit grows faint within me. My heart is dismayed inside of me. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I consider the works of your hand. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who descend to, send to the pit. Let me hear your loving devotion in the morning, for I have put my trust in you. Teach me the way I should walk, for, you, for to you I lift my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I flee to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For the sake of your name, O Lord, revive me in your righteousness. Bring my soul out of trouble, and in your loving devotion cut off my enemies. Destroy all who afflict me, for I am your servant. You think David had a right relationship with God? And he says right here that the Spirit of the Lord told him those things. Each and every Christian is born again by the Spirit of God. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, He lives inside of you so that you can be a holy, righteous person before God, that you can worship Him in spirit and truth, and so that you can be a light to the world. 
that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who art in heaven. So that when you're given the opportunity, you can tell them of the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. Wow. It's about a relationship. A relationship with God Himself through the Holy Spirit. So I want to move to the New Test back to the New Testament again. Talk about what Jesus did. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him when he was baptized. He went into the wilderness. He was tempted by Satan. He came out of the wilderness. He did not fall to temptation. And then we read in Luke 4, verse 16, Then Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and when he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery to the, of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. Now think what Jesus said to the disciples in that final discourse where Merle read from this morning, that they would do greater things than him, that the Holy Spirit would come to them and teach them and reveal them all truth and remind them of the things that Jesus said. The Holy Spirit is upon you because he has anointed you to preach the good news. He has sent you. He has given you authority and he has given you power to proclaim liberty, to give sight to the blind. It may not be physical, it may be spiritual. To release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. All because God has come to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Even though you can't see Him, you don't have that picture to show Him. See if it recognizes my face, so it just pops up. But my grandchildren will remember the face of their Nana, even at this age, if they don't see her for a while. That's not meant to say anything bad. <laughs> Hopefully we get to see them again in a few weeks. Hopefully my dad's coming to visit in a few weeks. We'll see. Jesus expounds upon Scripture, remember that, in the 40 days after the resurrection, teaching them all about what the Old Testament says about Him. Now fill in the blank how the Holy Spirit is going to continue to reveal things to them once He leaves. Because He's already told them this before. Keep in mind what paraclete means and what... Pronounce it for me. Pneuma. How is it pronounced? Pneuma. Pneuma. So you pronounce the P. See, well, I'm not used to that in English. Thank you. Four of the five times that paraclete is used is used by Jesus in John 14 through 16. So one more time in the New Testament, and it's in 1 John, when John, 1 John is written, and he says that you shouldn't sin, is the way I'm going to paraphrase it. But if you do sin, because see, we're made holy and we have the power not to sin. It is God's will for us to be sanctified through and through. So we should be getting rid of sin more and more and more and more into our life to the point we're totally sanctified, whether it's in this lifetime or not. But if you do sin, you have an advocate before the Father. But Jesus used it this way, and Merle read some of these. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate, comforter, counsel, helper, paraclete, to be with you forever. The Spirit, the pneuma, that's as good as I'm going to get, of truth. The world cannot receive Him because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He abides with you and will be in you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, He will testify about me. But I tell you the truth, it is for your benefit that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. Four times that evening, telling His disciples about what's going to happen and how that the Holy Spirit will be with them forever to complete their mission, to bring them comfort, legal counsel, aid, everything else. Even though they will not see Him, He will be with them and be in them. So what is the purpose 
that the Holy Spirit came the way that He came at Pentecost. Because Scripture says here that the Holy Spirit's already there. I said that He was and showed you that He was from Scripture in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost because the disciples, however many there were, we read in Acts 1 that there were at least 120, were together in one mind, one spirit, praying about the mission. Thy will be done, our Father in heaven. Your kingdom come, not my own. And because they were praying and purpose-driven, the Holy Spirit came in power to proclaim the gospel to all tongues, tribes, and nation. And isn't that what's going to happen in Revelation? Shouldn't we be somewhere along that path until then? Are we living that way as the church? The church started when the Holy Spirit came, and the church started in power. So I ask you to think about where the church stands in that point today. Because Jesus Christ will come and claim the church as a groom comes to claim his bride. Scripture also says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, doesn't it? So what does the Holy Spirit do for us? I've got a sheet down here that gives you 70 different uh, things that the Holy Spirit can do for you. You're welcome to take them. It's front and back. Study. I challenge you to do that in the next upcoming weeks. Because if I don't know my wife well enough, we're going from me instead of the grandkids, to know that she's the one that I would go to physically on this earth for comfort, for love, for affection, to take care of me, to even fix my boo-boos, then I don't understand and know her that well, do I? And how would that be if I went to someone else to find comfort? The Lord your God is a jealous God and you should have no gods before Him. He gave His one and only Son for you to redeem you back to His own because of how much He loves you. And when Jesus went away, He said, I will not orphan you. I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And He will comfort you and guide you into all truth. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utter ends of the earth. Which is exactly what happened at Pentecost. Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. They were praying and worshiping together in one place. Suddenly a sound, because we act to our senses, our ears were opened up to a sound, and everyone heard this sound. It was like a mighty rushing wind coming from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. The people outside heard it also. That's why they came. Verse 3, they saw with their eyes tongues like flames of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit the third person of the Trinity, enabled them to do so. Continuing on in Acts 2, and I'm going to go through this briefly, and hopefully you've read this some since I have implied about it, and hopefully you'll read some more in Acts. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, the perfect timing for the Spirit to give this gift. And when this sound rang, rang out, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in their own language. Then we, the scripture mentions, Luke mentions each of the different tongues and everything that were there, and there could be more than this. And they said at the end of verse 11, we hear them declaiming the wonders of God in our own tongues. They were astounded and perplexed in verse 12, and they asked one another, what does this mean? But others mocked, because that's what's going to happen. People are either going to say, yeah, to Jesus or no to Jesus. But yeah, if I say yes to the relationship with my wife and then don't realize who she is and don't come to her for comfort and love, what kind of relationship do I have? What kind of relationship do I have if I go to another? I don't have much of a marriage, do I? I don't have much of a covenant. <clears throat> Others mocked. Then, and said they were drunk on new wine, 
Verse 14, then Peter stood up with the eleven, not just Peter, he spoke up with the eleven, he lifted up his voice and addressed the crowd. And he talks about what is prophesied by Joel and how that, that God will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Verse 18, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Before blood and fire and billows of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord. This is the church age, the day that we're pro to proclaim Jesus' love and passion for us until He returns and He, the Holy Spirit, is here to comfort us and guide us all, all along the way until that comes. And guess what? He seals us for that day also that we are God's own. He is our advocate and we have another advocate before the Father, Jesus. Wow. Men of Israel, listen to this message. Jesus of Nazareth, you crucified. But this was part of God's plan and foreknowledge, verse 23. You nailed him to the cross, verse 24, but God raised him from the dead. Then he goes on in verse 25 to say what David has wrote about him. And David says, My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will dwell in hope. And he said this long before he ever saw the face of Jesus. Verse 27, Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you let my Holy One see de decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. And that's why I read the scriptures to you before. Because it was the Spirit of God who did this personally to David. Verse 30, He was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. Verse 32, God has raised Jesus to life, to which we are all witnesses. The Holy Spirit comes to give us that information, that power to equip us, to comfort us, even though we might be persecuted for it to even give us power in the face of death that we know that nothing can separate us from God's love, that not even one hair will be harmed on our head unless it's in God's will and plan. And that we don't need to know all the things, but we've been given power to live this life until we spend eternity with Jesus face to face again. Verse 33, exalted then to the right hand of God, he has received from the, pro from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. Jesus received the Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now and see on the day of Pentecost. Verse 36, Therefore let all Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and God. And see how the God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus are all mentioned there. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Who did that? The Holy Spirit. They asked Peter and the other apostles, there we go again, Peter's not alone, what shall we do, brothers? Peter replied in verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, This promise of a person coming to reside with you so that you can have a personal relationship with God this belongs to you and your children and to all who are, all, are far off, to all whom the Lord your God will call to himself. With many other words, he testified and urged them, be saved. Now I want you to think, be saved from what? Because I hear that all the time. I'm saved from my sins and I'm going to heaven. That's not really what the scripture says here. It says, from this corrupt generation. Yes, you're saved. You have received the gift of eternal life. You've been born again so that you can live for God in freedom to choose whether to live for Him or not and to be a light for Him or not. That you shouldn't continue to live as you did before. That you are a new creation in Christ, being changed and transformed through and through, giving your bodies as a living sacrifice which is wholly acceptable unto the Lord which is your reasonable act of service, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Those who embraced His message, verse 41, were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the believers that day. Now, what did the church do after this? Let's keep reading. 
Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. A sense of all came over everyone, and the apostles performed many wonders and signs. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and good, they shared with anyone who was in need. With one accord, they continued to meet daily in the temple courts and to break bread from house to house, sharing their meals with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, when I used to read those verses as more of a child, less mature, I'm saying that as, as scripture references again, I used to think, yeah, that's nice. That's the utopia version. But I work hard for the things I've got. But you know, I wouldn't have the breath of life that's in me if it wasn't for God. And every good gift comes from the Father above. And He might just give me everything I have so that I can share with others. Amen. It's not just a utopia vision. It's not just what heaven is to be like. It's how the church is supposed to live today. And the power to leave all the things of the earth behind is because they don't matter anymore to you. Because you have eternal life through Jesus Christ your Lord. And proof of that because of He who lives inside of you. So that He can live through you. I can finish there, but I'm not done yet. I've got a little bit more that I want to mention. One other word. Metatanoi. He's like, what is that word even you're saying? Repent. To change one mind towards your viewpoint of sin. He's not done there. And how you are to change your life if you truly believe it. And you've been given the power to do it because God dwells in you in the presence of His Holy Spirit. In Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, we all read about John the Baptist. Mark has this written down. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. Verse 8, he says, I baptize you with water. But he, Jesus, not a force, a physical person, will baptize you with another person, the Holy Spirit. In Matthew, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And if you remember what I wrote from, wrote from David in that psalm, the Holy Spirit gave him straight paths. Goes on to read in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7, he says, you brood of vipers to the Pharisees, the ones who proclaimed to be holy but weren't. They were blind, leading the blind into destruction. To destruction. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Well, it would have been the Holy Spirit, wouldn't it, if the Holy Spirit convicted them and they listened to what the Holy Spirit said to them. What proof then do they have of repentance? John says it in verse 8, produce fruit then... In keeping with repentance. Don't just say I'm a father of Abraham. Don't just say I'm saved, I'm a Christian, and not have proof of it. It goes on to say that in verse 9. And do not presume to say to, for yourselves, we have Abraham as your father. Anyone can say these things. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. Now, verse 10 the axe lies ready at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus echoed these words, including the words to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John then again says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one more powerful than I am, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, maybe the fire refers to Pentecost. Maybe it doesn't. If you read the next verse, he says, His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather his wheat in the barn. Either you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I'm not saying this is the only translation for that verse, 
or you will be burned up. It says it here, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Because either you accept the Holy Spirit and you are a son of God and the Holy Spirit is changing you and sanctifying you through and through so that you will live your life as a holy individual bringing glory and honor to God, giving up your bodies as a living sacrifice which is wholly acceptable to God, worshiping Him in spirit and truth and drawing people into the kingdom or you're scattering instead of gathering. In Luke 3, we'll see a little expounding upon that because Luke goes on to write, even tax collectors came to be baptized. They asked, what should we do? What should we do? I'm saved and I know it, and my life will surely show it. If it doesn't, maybe I'm just proclaiming. Maybe I'm just full of a lot of hot air instead of the breath of life. He gives several examples here of how to live. Because it says the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts, not just their mind, but in their hearts, if John could be the Christ. John answered all of them, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize with you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he goes on to write, His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus will come to claim his bride, the church, to separate the sheep from the goats, however you want to look at it. And you will be accountable for the life that you have lived. So are you born again? And are you letting Him guide you into all truth to reveal you, to you about Jesus, to transform you, to use you for God's kingdom, which was at hand when Jesus came, Scripture's clear, and is even closer today to coming to sight. For us. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repentance was part of Peter's message. It was part of John the Baptist's message. It was part of Jesus' message. The Holy Spirit was a part of their message. He will comfort you and guide you. He will be your advocate. Is He doing that for you? Are you living powerfully for the kingdom? Many will come to him and say that we even did mighty miracles in your name, Jesus. But Jesus will say, well, depart from me. I did not know you. So I am going to close with this scripture from Matthew chapter 12. Don't forget your sheets down here about the Holy Spirit. Because if I had a list, if Sherry helped me out with this list and said, here's all the things that she'd like to do for me and what she'd like for me to do for her, Guys, wouldn't that make our job easier? Come on, we wouldn't have to guess, right? I mean, we might love, her, love our wives to death, but it would be nice to have a little helpful sheet. It's all in Scripture. And God wants a relationship with you because of what Jesus Christ has done, and He put His Holy Spirit inside of you to guide you into all truth till He takes you home. Wow. In Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 18. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit on him, and he will pro proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice on the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not extinguish. He lead, he, till he leads justice to victory. Old Testament talking about Jesus. In his name the nations will pour out hope. This is from Isaiah 42, talking about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will guide you and remind you in the Old Testament and the New Testament who Jesus is. And He is your Master and Lord if He is your Savior. Verse 22, Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and He healed the man so that he could speak and see. Physical, so we can talk about spiritual. The crowds were astounded and asked, could this be the son of David? Huh. But when the Pharisees, the religious ones again, 
heard this, they said, Only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, does this man drive out demons. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be laid waste. And he's not just talking about Satan. He's talking about his kingdom, which you belong to one kingdom or the other. Hopefully you remember when I talked about that. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Oh, it's ironic that there's scripture that you're a light, a city on a hill, and that you can't hide your light. Because guess what? Otherwise you could be attacked and crumble and fall, couldn't you? And if, I, if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your spirits drive them out? Are you being led by the Holy Spirit or another spirit? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, the power that Jesus did, the mighty miracles, that he said you will do even greater things, and then you have the proof of Pentecost plus many other proofs of the Bible. If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can you enter into a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. That's a whole topic for another sermon. You can take it for whatever you want to there. Whatever this means to you. Whoever speaks against the, son of the, against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. But verse 37, 33, excuse me, is crystal clear for you. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be glad. For a tree is known by its fruit. A Christian is known because they are like Christ. Then Jesus says, you brood of vipers. <laughs> Just like John the Baptist had to say to those who thought they were religious. Thought they were righteous. And I have to question where I stand when that comes out. What, what do I need to have the Holy Spirit help me with and clean out of my life? You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? I can't. I can't do it without my helper, my advocate. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of his good store of treasure, and the evil man brings out evil things out of the evil store of treasure. Oh, Spirit, help me to get rid of the things that I treasured before I had the treasure of you living with me. But I tell you that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Have you truly repented? Are you born again of the Spirit? Is He living through you? It's not just some mystical power or force. Every time you reject the Holy Spirit and what He's trying to do in your life, you're rejecting a person. That's why I'm trying to put a face on it for you. My wife comes to me again trying to comfort me and I push her away. Wow. Jesus sent his spirit to abide with you, to seal you, so you know that you're God's <coughs> own. So that you could be equipped and guided to live a holy life that brings God glory and honor. And Jesus will come again. And a fruit tree is known by the fruit that it produces. <coughs> Father in heaven, we do thank you so much for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We thank you that he did not orphan us. We thank you that we have an advocate before the Father, and we thank you that we have an advocate living in us. Oh God, let the Holy Spirit live powerfully through us, which means that I do need to deny myself and take up my cross and follow after Jesus, but I can't. It means that I do need to clean out the things in my life that don't belong there, but I can't. But Holy Spirit, you can. And I thank you for being with me and in me. Please live through me. 
I pray that for each and every one that's here today, and I pray they pray that prayer for themselves. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Holy One, our Savior and Lord. Amen.